Welcome everyone um, to today's webinar, Science to Policy from Earth Observation to Legislation. I'm Yunus Obamba Jaswa and I'm Research Manager at the Water Research Commission in South Africa. Next slide, please, Erin. So um, today's webinar will be recorded and it will be made available on demand if you'd like to have a copy of that. Um, it will also be on the IWA website with presentation slides and other associated information. Just also to note that the speakers are the ones who are responsible for securing copyright permissions for any work or information that they share today and that they will not have any legal copyright holdership with IWA and also that the opinions, hypotheses, conclusions, and any recommendations that are given in the presentations or any other materials associated with the webinar today are solely the responsibility of the speakers and are not the responsibility of IWA. Next slide. So in terms of etiquette for today's webinar, um, the chat box can be used for general requests and for other interactive activities. And the Q&A box, please use that to send your questions to the panelists. Please also note that the microphones of attendees are muted and that nobody will be able to respond to a raised hand emoji. Okay, so in terms of the agenda today, um, there's the welcome introduction, which I'm currently doing right now, as well as housekeeping rules and polls. Then our first presentation will be given by Alexandra Bell, who is going to present to us about the challenges and hurdles with moving in the science policy interface. Then it will be followed by a presentation by Mark Matthews, who's going to talk about um, the Earth Observation Program and input, input, inputting that into the National Eutrophication Program in South Africa. Then finally, we'll have um, Torsten Bondo, who's going to look at observation as a tool for SDG indicators and NDCs in the water domain. We will follow that up with a Q&A discussion and then some final remarks as well as conclusion of our webinar for today. Next slide. Okay, so in terms of the moderator and speakers, like I introduced myself earlier, I'm Yunus Obamba Jaswa. I'm with the Water Research Commission based here in South Africa. I manage a portfolio of projects around water resources quality, and we're basically a funding agency, but then we also do translate a lot of the research that we fund into um, policy. Then we have Alexandra Bell, who is from the University of Woodsburg. She's a PhD student there. Then we have Mark Matthews, who is a director of Cyanar Lakes, who was formerly based in Australia, but now, I mean, formerly based in South Africa, but now is based in Australia. Then we have Torsten, who is from DHI and um, is based in Denmark. Okay, so just a little bit of our community of practice. So the community of practice is basically a group of people who share common concern around a set of problems and have interest in a topic, in this case, it's earth observation, and who come together to fulfill both individual and group goals. The community of practice often shares best practices and creates new knowledge to advance a domain of professional practice. Um, interaction on an ongoing basis is also a very important part of this community of practice. Um, many of the community of practices rely on face-to-face -face meetings as well as web-based collaborative environments like we're having today to communicate, connect, as well as conduct community activities. So that's the what the community of practice is about. So specifically for the IWA Earth Observation, Observation Community of Practice, um, the community members have a shared domain of interest, competence, and commitment. Um, and we also want to create a common ground, inspire members to participate, as well as obviously guide their learning and give meaning to their actions. Um, we also want to pursue joint activities, discussions, problem solving opportunities, as well as relationship building and information sharing as well. Then uh, community members are actual practitioners as well and build a shared repertoire of resources and ideas that they take back to their practice, which is also an important point for in particular for the IWA um, Earth Observation, because we do know that the, the practitioners out there are not necessarily um, a lot. So it's good to have that community to share that um, best practice knowledge. Next, Erin. Okay, so um, in terms of the IWA, um, EO Community of Practice, once again, it's bringing um, together experts from different sectors, 
of the water industry that are involved in EO technologies and specifically for improving water quality and um, its management. Um, so the community of practice is linked to the Prime Water, which is an H2O2 EU project, um, Horizon 2020 EU project for those who might not be familiar with Horizon calls, and then also the GEO Aqua Watch initiative. Next. Um, in terms of geographical location, um, there's quite, uh, quite a bit of representation around the globe, globally, um, within the African continent, South America, North America, Asian subregion, and Australia as well. And then for sector representation, we do have quite a bit who are de definitely the dominant group is based in university or is involved in some type of research. We have consultancies and then we have um, government organizations. And I think that is quite reflective of the poll that was taken earlier in this webinar. Next. Okay, so in terms of priority areas, we have three priority areas so far. We are understanding the different types and applications of EO data. Um, we have sharing information on new technologies and then sharing the process of uptake of EO information by different users. So we initially had a first meeting on the 15th of March in 2022. That was the first one we had. We had about 240 participants who came and listed their expert perspectives, as well as some of obviously the experiences and challenges that they are facing working with the applications and tools. Okay, so um, within the Earth Observation community, practitioners have always um, had this hesitancy, and I can say that it's also not even just for this community of practice, but for everyone, it's the move to policy, and um, that is what the the, the community of practice aims to provide a platform to share these approaches of how we can move from um, application to policy. And I think those two paragraphs really um, detail that for us today. So for our webinar specifically today, we want to address that to see how the COP can address this move to, to policy and to legislation that we, that we are hoping to see in the EO um, applications and tools that we're using. Okay, so our first presentation today is by Alexandra Bell, like I mentioned earlier, and she is a PhD student at University of Würzburg, and she will be giving us a presentation that explores the challenges and hurdles at the science policy interface. Alexandra, when you're ready, you can please go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. Um, yes, so I'm Alexandra Bell and I'm a PhD student at the University of Würzburg and also work within a project that concentrates on land use change and climate change in West African countries. And as Unis just said, I'm going to be talking about exploring the challenges and hurdles at the science policy interface. Next, please. So I would like to start with this satellite imagery of our Earth because it shows us one of the exciting things about remote sensing, that it can provide us with this overall global view of our Earth, while at the same time, next slide please. It can also provide us um, with this example of a satellite imagery of daily with very detailed um, information on the condition of our Earth from di different spatial temporal resolutions. So in this example, we see um, Delhi, for example, with um, the northern part, so Old Delhi, um, and with the southern part, New Delhi, and you really see the impact of political decisions um, on the humans, for example, how they live in their town. However, the political decisions we make within our town area or also within our borders often do not make hold at our national borders, but go beyond. So one example is climate change, as we know. And if you look at West African countries, for example, um, they belong to countries um, which have a very low CO2 and methane emissions, but are those countries which will be suffering quite severely under climate change impacts. And here, Earth observation can really help to um, provide systematic and objective evidence in order to, for example, monitor compliance towards the goals set by the nations as well as the international um, community. Next, please. So when we look at remote sensing at the science policy interface, we're looking on the one hand side at goals and measurements on the political side, the impact on our earth, and how we can use remote sensing, the data and products, 
um, to provide an information which then can be translated into a knowledge and fed into this policy making process and also promote evidence based policy. And there's, of course, a reason why we're here together. So there are still a gap in application as well as challenges at this science policy interface. And one of them is really to get both of the sites of so spatial temporal resolutions and the thematic resolutions to combine them together to an information which is sensible for policy making. And on the other hand, to really disseminate and communicate the evidence from the scientific side over the science policy interface into the policy sector. And here there are also different um, stakeholders involved. And what I'll be doing is very briefly looking at um, challenges and hurdles from peer reviewed perspective, and then I'll be diving into a web based uh, questionnaire, which I conducted with a colleague of mine, uh, so Sarah Shim um, which looks at the perspective of different stakeholders at the science policy interface. Next, please. So when we look at the state of the art and look at literature from 2015 to 2020, we will see that studies which use EO for, um, in a kind of way for policy, more, more or less um, concentrate on problem identification and knowledge provisioning. So there is a gap in really using EO, at least from the scientific perspective for policy impact assessments, and also in this kind of way, also a future topic. And in order to push EO for policy, there are certain recommendations within the science sector. On the one hand, um, studies state that data availability and quality is an issue, so high resolution data or also ground truthing data for um, data validation, such as in developing countries, um, which is quite a topic which is often discussed there. And then the other hand is also the consensus on definition. So that's also pivotal if we look at, for example, to give you one example really only, is the definition of forests. So forests um, are defined in the nation's way differently. And this is, of course, an issue if we look at the Paris Agreement, for example, and we want to compare the progress within this policy sector of forests um, in regards to the goals which the nations, but also the international community has set themselves. And then the next point is that within science um, studies, there's often a very a unidimensional analysis approach. And here studies really say that in order to push EO for policy, that we have to um, start to conduct interdisciplinary approaches far more in order um, or by combining, for example, data sets um, from the scientific sphere and also from the policy sphere. Now, this is the scientific side. So it really shows the early applications or early methodological developments of EO applications for policy. And one of the reasons why I then wanted to make a step outside is to really look at the entire process chain from the science side into the policy sector. Next, please. And my colleague and I, we conducted this um, web-based survey in order to tackle the three different stakeholders we saw most important to be. So on the one hand, sciences um, or science, then intermediary organizations and policymakers. And we wanted to investigate dissemination and evidence or um, kind of ways of evidence communication, as well as um, remit sensing for policy directly. And we communicated our web-based survey via different channels. So for example, LinkedIn, Twitter, but also email lists. Next, please. And after two months, what we found was that 100 people touched upon our um, survey and 44 actually completed it. So if we look at these um, ones which actually, or participants which completed or at least touched, touched upon it, we will see that academics were the main respondents. And then followed by some people from intermediary organizations, but there were no policymakers which actually responded to our survey. So in our eyes or perspective, this is one of the challenges and hurdles which still exists is really our ability to reach out at least via such a web-based survey to other um, experts from different stakeholder groups. And I think this is a topic we could also discuss later on in the panel. Next, please. So what I want to show now is some of the examples of our results. And most of these answers now are now, of course, the perspective of academics and scientists. But what we asked them was whether they actually find uh, their work relevant for policymakers. And here, 77% said yes. And when we followed up, up with the next question of whether they find that their work should contribute to policymaking, 86.6% said as well, yes. Now, the interesting thing is here that we followed up with the next question. Next slide, please. 
namely whether they actually um, conduct policy relevant analysis. And this is where 63.6% .6 actually said no. So here there's another challenge or also gap which we, um, well, we, which we noticed, namely that most of the scientists actually think that the work should contribute to policy making and is relevant. But on the other hand, there seems to be this gap to really engage at the science policy interface and to conduct policy relevant anal analysis themselves. Next slide, please. So what we also were interested in, and that's why I thought the first um, poll question or the third um, poll question was quite interesting to see the results, because we asked about the necessary improvements um, in order to really push EO for policymaking. And what we find were exactly these four themes, which we mentioned beforehand as the most important ones. And now we also have some intermediary organizations or people from intermediary organizations, for example, or the general public also answering today. So on the one hand, the one of the most important themes was capacity development. So really building technical skills, training staff, but also in strengthening remote sensing training and academic curricula. And the next point, um, next slide, please. The next theme was uh, data supply, so access to data, um, data costs, but also the availability of space for remote sensing data. Next slide, please. The next theme was knowledge development, which was also very um, important now in the poll. So really in um, the knowledge of the requirements of policymakers regarding scientific results, such as accuracies, but also regarding the own knowledge about the policymaking process. And then as another knowledge also that policymakers should be aware of the potentials um, of remote sensing for policymaking. Next slide, please. And another theme was also really strengthening the science policy interface, namely, for example, through networking or really mainstreaming the integration of Earth observation into the policymaking process. Next slide, please. So to conclude, um, if we look at the key results, we see from the scientific perspective that especially policy impact assessment should be pushed. So really prior and post of policy implementation. And for example, that we should be um, increasing um, or increasing the use of interdisciplinary approaches. There is a general opinion that um, their own work should actually contribute or is relevant for policymaking, but there seems to be a kind of gap in actually really engaging at the science policy interface. And then in order to improve remote sensing um, and to push it into policy, capacity and knowledge development is important, data supply, but also um, promoting the science policy interface. Now, I would like to touch upon um, one of the pivotal points, which is the bias in, survey, in the survey. So on the one hand, that we weren't able to reach out to experts from the other two groups. But the other um, bias is also that we, own, well, based on the own connection, of course, have the most participants actually replying from Germany, as well as West African countries, owing to our connection to um, the project Vascal. This is a problem, of course. On the other hand, it can be actually quite interesting because we can, of course, distangle both um, sides, so both regions, and look at them separately regarding the answers as well, and also maybe compare them with each other. So what are the hurdles um, in both regions and how do they compare with, with each other and what works? And so to finalize, um, next slide, please. I was interested in, or what I'm interested in, is really to look at the entire process from the science, science side into the policymaking side. And of course, we have the different stakeholders which are important here. So what I did was that I noticed that this web-based questionnaire is not working to really get in contact with intermediary organizations and policymakers. So I thought I would rather go directly to experts and contact them or really meet them at conferences and try to involve them into this research. And this has been a super interesting and um, yeah, very nice opportunity and method to actually engage with experts from these two different stakeholder groups and has worked quite fantastic actually from my perspective. So all of the people I met um, really working at this um, science policy interface were very eager to engage and think it's a highly important topic and want to engage and push this topic um, further. And there are different um, hurdles and challenges which came up, and I want to point them out. On the one hand, that um, this user-driven development is super in, um, important. So to just pick one example, there's a statement, we have to work with policymakers, otherwise we might be developing products and space missions 90 degrees sideways with respect to their needs. 
Then the other point on the other side is also that policy, the policy side has also a commitment to actually communicate what they need. So regarding the Copernicus program, nation states have the responsibility of bringing their needs to the commission. Then at the same time, I'm finished in a second, um, two sentences, thank you. Um, on the other time uh, side, we have examples, for example, in Germany, where all of the interviews actually said that federalism is an issue in regards to bringing Earth observation into um, policy, so the question of competences also. And the last um, hurdle, which I think actually addresses all of us stakeholders, is the willingness to change, to really transform the urgency to act into an opportunity, the Vernon platform theory so to really act despite uncertainties and with this I um, I would like to conclude the next slide please and many thanks for your attention and very briefly saying I'm still looking for people to engage in intermediary organizations and um, policy makers so feel free to contact me please thank you Thank you so much, Alexandra, for that. And I think um, during the Q&A session, you can probably have the opportunity to just um, further ex um, explain some of the um, feedback you would like to receive for your study as well. And for our participants, if you have questions for Alexandra, you can please type them in the Q&A box. So the next presentation then is by Dr. Mark Matthews, and he is going to be taking us through integrating the EO program into South Africa's National Eutrophication Monitoring Program, the successes and challenges that have occurred so far. Mark, please, when you're ready, you can go ahead. Hi, Eunice, and uh, thanks very much. Uh, and uh, hello to everyone joining today. Um, I'd just like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to uh, share some of my story about um, my experience uh, integrating Earth observation into the National Eutrophication Monitoring Program in South Africa. Uh, you may notice that I'm an, currently in an airport lounge, so I apologize if there's any background sounds. <laughs> All right, so um, let's kick off. We can go to the first slide, please. So um, I think that whenever we, whenever we start with Earth observation, there must be there must be a a vision for Earth observation technologies. And I just like to start by acknowledging the Water Research Commission in South Africa, who've provided the funding uh, for us to build web and mobile applications for monitoring and harmful algal blooms nationally. And uh, it's really their foresight which has enabled um, great advances in this technology. Um, and while I'm not demonstrating the technology that we've developed today, my discussion today is more around sharing our story and our experience around um, how this technology has been developed and then further uh, the response to this technology from governments in South Africa, water companies, which effectively are parastatal organizations. Um, if wherever you are around the world, I'm sure that most of the water companies are state owned or at least partially government owned and are effectively um, government entities. And so I'm going to tell some of my story about how water companies um, government agencies have reacted to the technologies that we have developed um, and give you some insights around what I feel, um, the, how policy is lacking, which means that we are not able to fully exploit the technology which has been developed. So I'll just like to share briefly around the technology that Sino Lakes has developed uh, through funding primarily from the Water Research Commission. Uh, firstly, we have a web-based application, which we designed um, around the needs of the National Department of Water and Sanitation in South Africa. We worked very closely with them as we designed this uh, web uh, solution, and we took on board all of their needs and benefits um, that they wanted to get out of this, which primarily was filling information gaps in their monitoring program. So the technology effectively um, accurately detects cyanobacteria blooms, which are a toxin producing harmful species, uh, which occur in lakes and reservoirs and rivers and even oceans uh, worldwide. 
uh, by leveraging recent advances in Earth observation and satellite sensors, we were able to um, accurately detect cyanobacteria and algal blooms. And this led to um, products which give health advisories and give health risk levels to human health uh, for cyanobacteria in lakes around, around the world and in South Africa. And this is all based on World Health Organization guidelines. Um, in addition to that, we are able to also uh, give recommendations and detect the trophic status of lakes and reservoirs using the OECD guidelines. And um, in addition to that, uh, provide recreational advisories, um, giving recommendations to recreational water users, users on safety for water use. Uh, these are obviously very important, um, very, very important um, uh, responsibilities that water companies and governments have to warn citizens about potential health risks in lakes and reservoirs and in water bodies. And leveraging this technology, we were able to make a significant contribution and significant improvement on the state of the art um, through the South African uh, National Eutrophication Monitoring Program. And we proved that we could accurately determine key variables for monitoring cyanobacteria and algae by comparing it with data that was measured by the National Department in South Africa. And in addition to that, full critical information gaps um, that were existing due to challenges with monitoring around the country. Not only that, but we were able to provide this data within three hours of detection, effectively providing a near real-time um, system. And um, subsequently to that, we also produced a mobile application which presents this information in a ready to use format, um, similar to your weather application and available for lakes around the globe. Um, if you're interested in looking at the technology and how it works, you can download the mobile application. It's called SinoLakes from the app stores on Apple or either Google. I won't give you any more details around the technology. Um, you can explore it in your own time. Um, but now I'm gonna share about how the industry has reacted to this technology. Okay, next slide. So on the left-hand side of this page, we look at the benefits of Earth observation. And on the right-hand side of this page, we're looking at current regulations or interpretations, how water, how water companies currently monitor for harmful algal blooms. If you look at the benefit of EO, we can detect events within three hours of detection. On the right-hand side, you'll see how it's currently done. The results are typically two or three days after a sample is collected. So you can see that there's a big difference between those two. Secondly, spatial coverage. Remote sensing covers 100% of a water body, whereas currently one or two fixed sampling points are used per lake. Next thing, frequency. Uh, using uh, multiple satellite sensors, which have been launched at great expense by our governments, particularly the European Union, uh, NASA, et cetera, we can get updates up to six times a week. Currently, the way monitoring is performed is once a month or once every two weeks. So you can see there's a massive discrepancy between what Earth observation can do and how the status quo currently sits. Earth observation is fast, comprehensive, up-to-date. Current information is slow, limited, and outdated. In other words, we've got 10 times better public health outcomes as opposed to on the right-hand side, the way it currently works, there are information gaps, there's missed events, and there's a risk to public health. So I'd ask you to ask yourself, what do you think is in the public interest? Next slide. What some water companies are saying, this is how some water companies have reacted to our technology. First off, although it is excellent software, that has a lot of practical value. I'm not sure it is fit for our purpose at the current time. This is an actual quotation. <laughs> Next one, a monthly service subscription would be a challenge that is not currently a priority for our team. Next one, we are happy to keep partnering with you as the product when it can predict with accuracy at finer detail will be very beneficial for us. And I'll just briefly unpack some of these points. Firstly, 
there's an argument that it's not fit for purpose. There's an argument that it's not a priority based on cost. And there's an argument that it can't predict with enough accuracy, with, with enough detail. Next slide. How some water companies are reacting. Well, firstly, when water companies say it's not a priority or it's not fit for purpose, what they're really saying is, if we don't have to do this, we won't do this. In other words, they don't have to monitor um, spatially comprehensively. They don't have to monitor more than once a month. They don't have to monitor um, in near real time. In other words, the status quo is the status quo. Uh, secondly, if it could do X, then we would use it. This is the impossible ask. In other words, water companies are saying the information looks okay, but if it could do this, then we would then we would buy it. But again, this is just another excuse. In other words, they're completely ignoring all the benefits that it offers and um, are just effectively ignoring any of the benefits that it offers because they don't have to use them. Secondly, uh, a lot of the reactions we've had is let's do a research and development project. Uh, and effectively, their operational budgets are off limit. And that's um, reflected in one of the responses where they say, um, it's not currently a priority uh, for our budget. And we need to move towards a time where government becomes a customer of the services that have been developed. Um, government must position themselves much more as a user and a customer of these services. Um, thirdly, next point, we don't have blooms often enough. Well, I would say what you don't know, you don't know. Ignorance is bliss, as they say. Um, we can do a 10 times improvement on current things, uh, on current technologies, and yet water companies choose to ignore events. They're choosing to ignore health risks. They are liable for those risks, but because current regulations do not insist they, that they use these technologies, um, effectively, you don't know what you don't know. Uh, we can't procure it from a single supplier. One of the other challenges we found is that there are not enough providers in the market, which means that in many cases, water companies are saying to us, oh, we would love to use it, but we can't procure it from a single supplier. Um, and then lastly, you're creating more work from us. Uh, as I mentioned, ignorance is bliss. If the water companies don't have to know about a problem, often it's easier if they don't have to know about a problem. And so the lesson of what we've found in my experience is if it's not mandated, it won't be used. Uh, next slide. So let's talk a little bit more about these policy gaps. And then this is the last slide in my presentation today. So first of all, what are the regulations around turnaround time? In other words, if there is a, a harmful algal bloom, which is a clear risk to public health, what is the turnaround time that water companies and governments are expected to notify the public of these events? Three hours or less or three days? <laughs> Secondly, there are no regulations on how comprehensive sampling should be done spatially. Should we say one sample per hectare? Uh, water companies would then spend hundreds of thousands of dollars sampling across the whole um, lake at any point in time. But remote sensing can do this. There are no regulations on sampling frequency. In other words, governments and water companies are at liberty to decide how they are going to um, how often they're going to sample, be it once a month, um, in which case there is a significant public health risk which is going undetected. And in our experience, uh, what we have found is that this is not the story for all water companies. There are some water companies that are wanting to do a better job. They are wanting to innovate. They are wanting to take advantage of the benefits that Earth Observation can do. And we've had a good experience working with, with those governments and those companies. But by far the majority of customers, it's just too easy for them to keep ignoring these technologies because the regulations simply do not exist that, in, that, that support the industry and the use of this technology in industry. So EO technology will only be needed if policies are implemented that hinge on the technological benefits leveraged by Earth Observation. And lastly, Earth Observation can significantly improve public safety outcomes. And as I mentioned, a 10x improvement, but will remain optional until such time as policies are implemented that demand current regulations are changed that are in the public interest. So I hope it's been an interesting 
uh, story that I've told you today. And again, I'd like to acknowledge the Water Research Commission for having the vision to fund these types of technologies. And um, I would like to thank the other speakers and uh, the hosts of this webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark, for that presentation. I think there are about two questions in the Q&A for you. So maybe you can just take a look at that as well. And we can also um, discuss that further during the panel session. Okay, so the final presentation for today is by Torsten Bondo, and he is going to um, take us through Earth Observation as a tool for determining SDG indicators and NDCs, specifically in the water domain. Torsten, when you're ready, you can please go ahead. I am ready. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak. My name is Torsten Bondo. I work for DHI. DHI is a global water resource management company. We work with the hydrological modeling tools and software. And we also have a large team, 30 staff working on satellites and have worked in the past on how satellites can support SDG indicators. And are we are also briefly looking into how satellites can support the NDCs with a focus on the water domain where we come from. Next slide, please. So uh, for those of you who don't uh, work in this domain and, and have limited knowledge, we touched upon this, but satellites are important because they offer continuous uh, data supply of environmental change. There's now a big historical archive, almost going back 40 years of satellite data that covers the, uh, the globe from pole to pole. And there are a range of new sensors and satellite being launched uh, with an uh, increasing rate that, that offers new opportunities and, and data to, to the public. So data is out there. There's a lot of data in different resolution and, and, and capabilities. Next slide, please. What is now also becoming interesting is that uh, alongside with more satellites being launched, there's also an evolution in, in what is possible to do. There's a large community of um, analysis tool being developed now, the ability to implement satellite solutions in the cloud and IT solutions also offer new opportunities. The, the, the new things is also how do you engage with the users in this, allowing users to work directly with the satellite data and implement and upload their own data to support uh, the, the tools and, and developments of, of the end services also. So all this is, is possible right now. So this should be demand driven, driven and needs driven also. And this is what is happening also. Next slide, please. So um, satellites serve uh, the global agendas, the Paris Agreement, there are a number of satellites that can uh, offer information about climate change. And uh, uh, there's also a lot of uh, satellite information that goes into the SDGs. I'll come back to that on the water domain. And finally, the, the, the Sendai framework, uh, there are satellites that support um, disasters when they strike, flooding and earthquakes with uh, near real-time information, allowing uh, the users to get that information and act up on this. So satellites are part of all the global agendas also. And uh, we think also this will remain the case and even increase in the future. Next, please. Uh, fresh water is under pressure because of climate change, because of population increase. Um, there has been a rapid decrease in, uh, in the quality of fresh water globally. And right now it is such that uh, two thirds of the global population uh, from time to time have uh, less access to water or experiences water scarcity. And that's expected to increase in the future also with up to half the global population that will experience water scarcity. Also, some of the most important uh, freshwater ecosystems, such as wetlands, have been uh, degraded since um, industrial revolution and cut down to over two thirds of, of what it was um, uh, back in 1900. So there is a huge need to look at these freshwater ecosystems and inform about them and inform about freshwater use so that uh, policymakers can take informed decisions. And this is what we are working on. Next slide, please. 
Um, in the SDG framework, uh, the, the protection of freshwater ecosystem is formulated, formulated as, uh, as such here in target 6.6. Uh, with the indicator 6.6 specifically uh, tracking changes in times of water-related ecosystems. And here the aim is to monitor and evaluate um, uh, these changes and then directly inform policymakers to reach the 2030 goals. Next slide, please. When this was put in place, uh, UNEP is custodian agency for this, uh, the UN Environment Programme. And they put uh, up a request for getting data on this uh, when they developed the methodology to, to uh, look at this indicator. And what they saw what, was that a, a lot of the UN member countries could not report on their freshwater ecosystems. So UNEP turned to the space agencies and the global research uh, institutes, the Joint Research Commission, and asked them to work with UNEP in developing global uh, available uh freshwater data and this is what has happened also so next slide please um this is a bit messy slide but i would like you to look at the yellow box here um unip uh, developed a tool the freshwater ecosystem explorer that uh, is is listed this sdg 661 app in particular, there are a number of uh, freshwater ecosystems that is being monitored only by satellite data. And I think this is one of the few really pure SDG indicators only observed with satellites. So uh, here we track surface water, the permanent surface water season. We track reservoirs. We look at water quality, turbidity, trophic state. And we also look at wetlands, uh, wetlands extent and mangroves, uh, all gathered from different space agencies. And some of this is done by the UNEP DHI Technical Center that, uh, that uh, is part of um, the support function for, for the UN Environment Program. And the way it works is that uh, these um, global earth observation data is put into this platform. Uh, there's running a number of statistics on these and these statistics go to the UN statistical division, and those are then informed for the member states um, in order for them to see what are the changes in the, their freshwater ecosystems. Uh, next, next slide, please. And this is basically how it looks, uh, so we have an idea about this. Um, on the left side, you see how we are able with satellite data to cover large scale nationwide mapping uh, with the uh, a temporal resolution allowing us to see how these surface water changes over time, how the wetland fluctuates, how different lakes um, also fluctuate in sizes. And on the right, you see the detail that's, uh, that's available right now in terms of what is possible to map here. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, what to do about the NDCs also. There has been a work ongoing already in, in this domain also, especially the Red Plus project, project has been looking how to, to use satellites to monitor forest degradation, forest um, reforestation, etc., cetera, and, and been feeding this into national uh, designated contributions also. But in the water domain, not a lot have done, and this is, we are trying to tackle now by, by looking at how can satellites support wetlands mapping, seagrass mapping, mangroves and peatlands, where there are large quantities of carbon stored in these and, and fluctuations of carbon and other greenhouse gases. Next slide, please. So there are a number of stakeholders that can benefit from information about knowing what are the carbon stored in these water domains also. Um, given time, I won't go into this, but, but, but just to briefly mention that there's both the sort of uh, government, uh, state uh, and provincial uh, ministries that can benefit from this uh, to do uh, policy changes, but there's also a private market, the voluntary carbon market that can benefit from this also. Private landowners, uh, land management association. Next, next slide, please. At DHI, we try to, to look at wetlands, uh, and we are now trying to combine satellite data, where satellite data provide information about soil moisture, evapotranspiration, vegetation, 
combining this, this with hydrological modeling and emission models to get this uh, change in net carbon gain and loss. Because the important is that there's a methodological guideline that can uh, really prove this data uh, and make sure that it is up to a certain standard. And, and this is what is needed also to take this field any further is that, that, that it is credited uh, carbon credits. Uh, and, and we are working towards this right now. Uh, next slide. So to conclude, uh, I think we have uh, already a lot ongoing in, in terms of uh, using satellites for SDG indicators. Uh, they, this alone could be a, a full um, webinar session. And there's a lot going on in terms of uh, using EO data also for um, uh, other kinds of water uh, reporting. The NDCs are the next barrier to break, I would say, and, and uh, we look forward to work on this in the future. And uh, thanks, Eunice, for organizing this. Over to you. Thank you so much, Torsten, for that. I'm um, just on time. <laughs> I was about to send you a reminder. Um, thank you to all our presenters um, today for their brief um, presentations. I know they could have definitely gone into a lot more. And as Torsten said, I think each uh, presentation could have been a separate um, webinar. So um, in terms of the question and answer session, I think I'm going to start with um, Mark, if um, Torsten and Alexandra, that's okay, because um, Mark might be leaving us at any time to catch his flight. <laughs> Mark, there were a couple of questions that came in the q and I think around cost, um, which maybe, and I know you addressed um, it in the chat, but then, I mean, sorry, in the Q&A box, but I think it would be good for you to just give your opinion around um, Jordi's question. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Eunice. Um, yeah, so the question was, um, if the, the cost of Earth observation provides enough benefits and if it is, if it is affordable, and also if it is, um, if it can be used for forecasting. So like any other, data data source earth observation is a great tool for forecasting current forecasting is done using in situ monitors monitoring you know cell counts or uh, fluorescence signals and earth observation is no different uh, it's a very powerful tool for um, producing time series which can in turn be used for forecasting um, in addition to that there was a question around cost if you go out into the market and you compare the cost of in situ instruments for monitoring harmful algal blooms, if you could look at the cost of mit mitigation technologies for uh, treating or removing the effects of algae in lakes, although that's not quite monitoring, but it's more around the mitigation of the impacts of harmful algal blooms, the cost of earth observation technologies is very, very minimal compared to other technologies which are being used in the industry uh, to monitor and, uh, and treat algal blooms. So I would say that um, yeah, in my opinion, it is both um, cost effective and it is very useful for forecasting. Um, so, yeah, that's. Uh... Okay, and Mark, then there was also another question coming from um, anonymous attendee who said that, would you agree that governments beyond mandating monitoring also need to take policy action for solutions? I think this is really the problem for the lack of EO monitoring because right now they can use your excuse that you um, illustrated in your presentation that you don't know what you don't know. Yeah, thank you, Anonymous, for your, your comment here. Um, absolutely, I think that the, the issue that we don't see adoption is because the policies are not there to support the adoption of the technology. Um, and, I, and I really feel like um, government needs to position themselves a lot more as a user of these services and of these data. Um, in particular, um, you know, in the water industry. Um, and so, absolutely, the, the problem is there are far too many excuses um, when it comes to using the benefits of the technology. So, I don't know if any of our other panelists have, have an opinion or experiences they could share around. Uh, Mark, I just really like your point about the, um, the, the fact that um, that institutions often want this uh, yet another R&D project and are not willing to sort of uh, support what they have um, been developing and not 
it, it just doesn't make sense if we want to continue this industry. It's it's very difficult to work on the. So you put a lot of effort into developing stuff, and then you are not ready to support it after development, and and just point to to another R and D project. It's a problem. Yeah, absolutely. Even in I'm in Minnesota currently, and I I was um, interacting with um, some colleagues here who are also struggling to get long term support for the programs for the outstanding work that they've done which, um, you know, this Earth observation data has been used for national reporting. Um, in South Africa, we've used it for reporting to parliament even. Um, here in Minnesota, I know they use it for their national state of environment reporting. And yet, if you look at behind the scenes, there's no long-term plan from government to support these services, to support um, the scientists who are producing the information, uh, to provide the policies that say we are using this long term, the funding, etc. So that's that's not only an experience, um, that's an experience worldwide at the moment. There's not the, there are not the programs in place to support the ongoing use of Earth observation. Um, it, it's very true. Uh, the, the products are there, the services that are there, the data is there. But what is lacking is simply sort of long term funding to support this uh, and, and not having to go to the space agencies or the uh, easy uh, research programs, etc. Yeah, so I think the challenge is trying to trying to get these programs into government departments that are not the space agencies, so they can be supported long term. Um, and, you know, that will see um, these services becoming commonplace around the world, and it will be we'll see an improvement in the science. We'll see an improvement in the products provided the support is provided uh, from government. Yeah, I think maybe just to jump in there, um, maybe Alexandra can also come in as well. But how do you think that an effective plea could be made to legislatures, um, for for instance, to to sort of circumvent this position that we find ourselves in, where um, or applications just remain R&D projects, basically. <laughs> yeah. Alexandra, I don't know whether you want to take have a take on that before Mark and Torsten come in. Um, I think that's a really difficult question from my perspective for, for me to answer, because at the moment, so what I could, for my all of my conversations which I had and the research which I've done so far, I'm at the point where I know that it's a huge issue with the funding, for example, that, that we... There are, I think one of the things is you have to look at the processes in how Earth observation is integrated and what Mark just mentioned is that those which are really successful are those which are implemented on the administration side or ministeri ministerial side and that is then successful. So the a plea to how to um, to tackle this is a huge issue. I was actually listening to a podcast yesterday which was talking with somebody from the um, environmental ministry about this topic and she even said it's a topic of legislation also of, of um, the voting system of um, every five or certain of years of groups change in policy, um, policy changing and getting this into the um, political um, community in order to um, discuss this issue of continuing program um, funding is really difficult. So I think some points have already been made with Horizon 2020 projects that say, for example, that you have certain um, commitments um, from the scientific side on the one hand side to contribute to societal or uh, society uh, perspective but it needs to be matched up with the other side so really being able to get funding more or less longer but I think Mark and Torsten can talk far better about this uh, from their perspective of experience really working with policymakers. I do not have this on this um, funding side. I think maybe before Mark and Tolstoy come in, there was also a question, but I think in a way it could be a suggestion where somebody is, um, another anonymous attendee is saying that, you know, maybe building and training capacity within personnel in government might also be a way to go. Yeah. Um, Mark and Tolstoy, do you also have any comments on that question? Um. I'm not sure I have comments directly for that, but but just to pick up the conversation, yeah, what Alex was saying, um, I, I'm a scientist. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> I would love to know how to interact with policymakers, but I don't. I don't have the skills to interact with 
with re regulators, with policymakers. And so I think that if we can somehow create a forum where earth observation scientists who are abreast of the technologies, who are implementing the technologies and have the know-how can somehow interact with, um, with professionals who are equipped to uh, engage with regulators, engage with policymakers and people who are writing the policy themselves. Um, we need the support of policymakers um, to, to help us through this process, because as a scientist, I also feel very unequipped um, and ill-equipped to engage uh, um, you know, with, with policy and regulation from my perspective. Can I just jump? Oh, sorry. Sorry, go ahead, Alexandra. I'll just really quickly jump in because um, my thought was just, I m maybe misunderstood all li also a little bit your question, but I think if you look at intermediary organizations, I mean, from a scientist perspective, it's really difficult in a certain way because the gap is quite large, depending on the hierarchical structure also. So it depends on how far are you in your scientific research, which position do you hold actually, for example, are you actually in contact, contact with policymakers or with people who are in contact with policymakers themselves? So how active are you? So I think on the one hand, you have as as a scientist, you have to be quite active to actually get to this position in order to really communicate any kind of in evidence or try to transform the entire system, which we have. And talking about systems, if you look at for example, intermediary organizations, they often hold a position which act actively can evolve or get involved with policymakers, which is from the university perspective also sometimes very difficult. So there's this kind of demand also that you need to have the capacity of money, of time to actually get somebody being involved with the political side. So I think it's more or less... Um, a very act so when I was talking with somebody from an intermediary organization, she, she said, for example, she worked very hard in getting this contact and engaging with policymakers and then actually finding and determining the person who's relevant for the topic. So maybe from the political side, they also have to far more structure, them, structure themselves, find out who's actually has the competency for certain topics like EO. So there are in Germany, for example, um, different um, groups being built, of course, or exist on the political side, but the information who can you actually address is not maybe there and available for everybody on hand. So maybe also here from the political side, there must be more engagement and bringing out this information to the people in a certain way. Sorry, a little intercourse. Thanks. Eunice, you can yeah, um, Torsten, would you go ahead? And I think maybe after sure. that, you can also take the question around um, EO bridging as a technology bridger for low income um, countries and populations as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can give an example that, that worked because we have focused on what has not worked in terms of operational support, but but actually in Denmark, where I come from, the common agricultural policy that's been placed by the EU is putting directives on, on uh, national agricultural agencies to monitor um, how the crops are doing during the season. And uh, they have tendered this out uh, in open competition. And this is actually a real operational service based on Copernicus data that is uh, functioning and working and, and sort of take this step that we would like to see in other domains also where where the uh, government is tendering out information that is needing this kind of uh, earth observation data and satellite data so we are very much engaged in this so this is a great example of that this can actually work uh, in, in in some domains also but we would like to see this much more often and also in the domain of water quality and wetlands and uh, soil moisture and, and a lot of other good tools that are available with uh, satellites. So that's just a comment to make. Um, Torsten, I think also be maybe before you come in, um, I just also wanted to say from the South African experience, I think from when we first started funding Mark, which is, I mean, we're in now in phase two of the program, and this is using EO from a water quality side. I would say South Africa has used EO for other applications, but for water quality is where um, we're struggling a bit. But now we do have an intergovernmental panel um, 
which has a working group specifically to look at um, applications for post-2025. Um, so at least now there's a panel at intergovernmental level, which I think then will be able to start, you know, the push down um, that we need, because I think for EO for water quality management, it's really ha has been a bottom up kind of approach, but now we need to, to come from the top. So I think with South Africa, we're kind of, we're kind of getting there. I mean, I recently filled out a poll where they were asking, you know, where do you see um, EO going? And I think that that's good progress if we're seeing it at that level. You know, the next thing we needed, obviously, is to, to come into the president's address and we know we're there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, um, Torsten, there was a question on, I think somebody wanted to know what NDC stand for. And then also there was a question around um, Earth Observation applications for low, um, low and middle income countries. I think maybe you mentioned that in your presentation, how EO is bridging that gap. Okay, uh, the NDC, sorry about not making this clear, is the National uh, Designated Contributions. Uh, this is part of the uh, Paris Agreement where the uh, member countries have to report on, on their greenhouse gas emissions. So this is a reporting tool for this. And uh, it was mentioned that um, this is um, done in different ways in different countries also. So there are different ways to do this and they are not clear consensus always on how to do this also. So this is um, certainly uh, uh, something that, that that is very much up to, to debate and, and how to do this using satellite data is even less clear. But um, I, I'll leave it there. Um, on, on the question uh, on low income countries and how satellite can support this, I think I can give a good example on, on how we have worked with the European Space Agency that is working directly with the uh, development banks on setting up projects and initiatives um, feeding into development uh, work um, where satellites uh, are being implemented in projects in developing countries. So uh, this is both on the capacity building level, but also on the direct service level in offering information on droughts and floods and uh, land degradation, etc., and land use. So this is um, something that the European Space Agency is engaging with the development banks, the Asian Development Bank, the World Bank uh, in this. And uh, there are certain trust funds going into this also where uh, satellite data and earth observation data is being channeled um, uh, or programs are, are being paid by this uh, through uh, trust funds also. So um, that answers part of your question, but there's a lot of activities going on and there's a big open source community also coming out now with free and open data for a lot of uh, low income countries also. Uh, cloud platforms, etc. So there's really um, a lot uh, taking place in this domain. Thank you, um, Tristan, for that. I think um, for Alexandra, oh, okay, uh, maybe before um, Alexandra you go, I just want to thank Mark for his participation in the uh, webinar today. He says that his um, his gate is open, so he has to get ready to board his flight. Thank you, Mark, and wish you a safe um, journey back. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Eunice, and to the IWA, Erin, Isabella, and, the, and my fellow pa panelists. It was great to interact with you today. Thank you. Right. So I think, Alessandra, just to come back into um, the kind of information that you think is relevant that um, policymakers would like to see. So we have different types, obviously, you know, policy briefs, more scientific um, writing. But what do you think, in your opinion, will be more useful? I think? Um, so in my opinion, now, from my experience from a ministry, it would be policy briefs and short um, short recommendations, for example, um, just in how I know how the minister, for example, um, used information and um, was given also provided information how I would provide it. Um, from the questionnaire itself, I we unfortunately can't really say what policymakers would like to have. So this is, of course, now only a very small opinion, which I just now had. Um, from the survey, as I showed, it was more or less um, academics and scientists who replied what actually works for them. And that was most of them actually wrote scientific papers. 
um, interestingly, but um, I would be interesting to see as a follow up question um, whom they have as a first contact to give these scientific papers, whether it's more in the administration, for example, or if it's actually really the high level policymakers who get this kind of information, because um, I would rather not think so, but that's just my own opinion of my work. Um, but also, if we look at concrete um, examples, they mentioned for, um, maps and figures, for example, which you, were very helpful to bring information to policymakers, which uh, makes sense, of course, also if we look at Earth observation, the power of um, using maps, for example, and figures, um, just as some examples. Okay, and then in terms of engagements, what type of engagements do you think? Because, I mean, if we take our classic conferences, for instance, we know that it's really academic people and researchers who go there, you know, so what, how, what do you think in terms of the engagements that could bring policymakers together with um, researchers or scientists in the EO space? That's a good question. I think it's one of the questions we were eager to um, target with our survey, but weren't able to really get in contact with intermediary organizations or with policymakers. So I think it's very difficult to reply to this question, but I do think that at least from my personal experience, it was really the personal contact in engaging with these experts, which um, was the best way because over the web-based questionnaire, for example, I wasn't able myself to get in contact um, with um, people or experts from these two groups, but getting in contact personally at a conference, for example, really helped a lot in engaging and um, only shortly, briefly, just saying hello and what is the topic about and then following up afterwards, which was a really nice opportunity, I think, to bridge, uh, bridge both sides. Um, I could imagine that intermediary organizations have a certain role and also in facilitating such opportunities and networking in a certain way between these um, groups um, and also in targeting more interdisciplinary approaches and bringing people to to one place in a certain way. So I think there are many different opportunities. Um, I would like to maybe ask Torsten if he wants to jump in because you owing to your experience also. Torsten, please go ahead. Well, I, th I think um... The question is how to, to bring the policymakers and, and the earth observation specialists together. I think um, from my experience coming from a small country, we have relatively good access to the politicians also. I think what um, what I've also seen from, from colleagues um, in similar institutions across uh, Europe and the world is that uh, they're very technical science uh, organizations coming from R&D and uh, from a team organization perspective, they are not geared so much to, to tackle these kinds of discussion also. And it can be out of uh, financial reasons that they, they don't have uh, a lot of uh, business developers or senior teams to take these discussions. So, so it can be from, from a simple manpower issue that there's not enough money from these team and research organizations to take these discussions because it takes time and it, it takes time to build these networks also. So I think that's one of the reasons that traditionally these uh, remote sensing community have grown out from R&D, but, uh, but they are not sort of uh, tailored from the beginning to, to tackle uh, the discussions with policymakers just to, to, to cut it very roughly, but, but it, there might be something to this. But I do think that it's also, if we look at funding, for example, it's more or less pushing more into interdisciplinary um, work in, in bringing stakeholders together. Um, and I think this, this can also be an opportunity to push some kind of collaboration and in order to opening it, open up more or less um, these very research tight um, communities to other stakeholders and promote the engagement. But I also think from your perspective, what you just mentioned, that it's really dependent on the country we're looking at mm. and at the policy field also. So it depends really on the field, what I find as well, uh, also because um, certain policy sectors are quite far in integrating Earth observation into the political field and others are quite far away. So in, in really looking and what is the political system behind it? So how can we break it up and understand it in a certain way? How also the policymakers think and how can we then address them with the certain um, information and evidence which is tailored also to them? 
Yeah, I think Alexandra, maybe I can um, pause to take this question because I think it kind of follows what you are you're talking about right now. So Valentin has said, I think that one of the major problems is the lack of close collaboration between researchers and policymakers. The researchers work on their own agenda, which does not necessarily meet the demand in policy formulation. The best way would be for the researchers to have funding from government to investigate current needs of population which are formulated as possible as policy. Usually the funds come from outside and the research center have to work according to the funders' needs. <laughs> so that's, I think, also what you're trying to say in a kind of a roundabout way. Yeah, 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 yeah mm -hmm. that sums it up quite well. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah. think so too. <laughs> okay, um, I don't see any other questions that we haven't answered. So I think we can maybe just... Um, kind of wrap up our discussions. Maybe um, I'll start with you, Torsten. Maybe you can just tell us a little bit more about um, what the UN DHI um, activities are, as well as some of the space programs you're in. And then um, Alexandra will um, close us off also with yes. some of the stuff that she's involved in. Yeah, I think uh, coming from a big organization like DHI, we have been fortunate to work with with big organizations like uh, the UN Environment Program for, for years. Also, we have the UNIT DHI Center, a technical center supporting uh, the water division of a uh, unit with the technical work. Uh, so this allows us to, to, to get direct access to um, to these policymakers and help them uh, in a support function uh, with with the uh, unit driving the demand, so to say. So we we know uh, what these policymakers need in that case also. So this is we have been very for fortunate having this unit DHI center at at DHI. Um, so and the work with these space centers has allowed us to uh, develop services. Uh, in the sense that these R&D projects that we have discussed in today have been actually uh, supporting our work for, for many years also. Uh, since these operational services are still hard to come by also, and uh, therefore we are still depending on research and development work in, in this domain also. Hopefully uh, the next decade we'll see more and more standalone uh, operational commercial services being developed in this domain but um, so far we still need R&D projects and there the space agencies are very important so I'll hand it over to Alexander for closure but thank you very much for inviting me for this sure Alexandra go ahead um, yes, so, I mean, in general, what I'm trying to do in my work now is to really get an overview of um, the status quo, the challenges, for example, and the hurdles of uh, bringing EO into um, policy. And I think we saw from the scientific side, um, we can quite nicely see some of the hurdles which have been pronounced and which were now also a little bit um, shown also in the poll. Um, I think um, getting to the, you know, involving experts from the intermediary organizations and policymaker sides would be very interesting. So I've been starting to do this with experts. Um, so contacting experts from conferences I just mentioned and really get engaging with them and I saw very other side of a different field so looking let's say it that way looking into the literature for example I saw that we we really are looking at the early methodological developments of earth observation for policy on the other hand when you really engage with stakeholders you see how much is actually been pushed and been done already in the field of EO for policy. Um, very different on the country level. So depending on the country, depending on the policy focus, I have the feeling. Um, so it's very dependent on what kind of political system you're actually looking at and how far we are. And um, I think in this regard, we have to far more understand the process of how Earth observation information is actually gathered, produced, and then put into um, applications um, for the science uh, science field, but also for the society. I mean, um, really in this regards. Um, so to sum up, um, this is um, at the moment my work. So the next will be really to conduct some more interviews and in putting the picture together. So in case somebody would be interested in um, conducting an interview with me, I would be really happy to for you to get in contact with me. And the other part is actually um, coming to trust and I'm also looking at the Paris Agreement and the nationally determined contributions because I think it's a real um, yeah, opportunity to use Earth observation in these international uh, agreements. Thank you very much also for the opportunity today.
Thank you, Alexandra, for that. And I, I just want to thank um, our participants as well for the questions that they um, posed during um, our q and I think it's important for us to understand what's happening on the ground because that's really what the community of practice is about, to share um, our situations, not necessarily have all the answers, but to, <laughs> to share the challenges um, that we have right now. And I would urge that those who are listening in today, if you do want to set up a program like Mark did, he knows the know-how how to do that. Torsten has um, explained all the activities that they involved in in DHI, um, the availability of models, all kinds of um, applications and tools, which I think is useful for those who are not only involved in R&D, but who want to also move into best practice. And I would also urge participants to be on the lookout for Alexandra's studies as well. If she does send um, questionnaires through, please do answer. I think um, they will really help to um, solidify the work that she will um, she will be doing. And hopefully at the end of her, her PhD, she can um, come back and present us some of the results and provide a backbone for how best we can, we can move in this space. <laughs> so with that, I'd just like to thank you um, all for the participation, our panelists and our participants as well. Just to round off, I just want to let you know about an upcoming webinar. Um, which is going to be happening on the 30th of November 2022, and it's um, accelerating sludge management towards sustainability, and that is also another IWA webinar. And then in terms of joining the network of water professionals, as you were, may well know, IWA brings professionals from different disciplines together to accelerate science, innovation, and practice um, to make a difference in addressing water challenges. Right now, they have a 20% discount code for new members. So please do um, take that offer up and make sure that you joined before the end of the year, 31st December, 2022. Okay, and with that, I'll officially like to thank everybody who participated in the webinar today and also to thank our panelists as well, um, Mark, Torsten, and Alexandra. Thank you so much for the preparations that you, you went through in um, delivering your content today. We do appreciate it, and I also appreciate it as well. Thank you all. Bye-bye.